right, good evening everybody, good evening. So, last Friday we had some technical difficulties, so we're going to do this one again. This will be Friday Night Lights Part 64, Equipped. We're going to pick up where we did last time. We're going to talk about God calling the equipped, and not, or God equipping the call, excuse me. God equipping the call, not calling the equipped. So, the first verse we're going to have is from Exodus ver, uh, chapter 4, verse 11. That's where we're going to start is Exodus chapter 4, verse 11. First we'll get some music and then we'll jump into it. your heads and pray with me we'll open this up with a prayer and then we'll get into it dear lord we just come to you right now lord and we just ask that you bless this message lord we ask you works here in order to get it out and it's in jesus name that i pray amen all right i'm going to say it this way god calls the unequipped and equips them for his glory God calls the unequipped and equips them for his glory. What do I mean by that? Well, when we go through the Bible, there are so many, so, so many different people and times that we see that the people that he called were completely unequipped for what they were called to do. They felt like there was no way that they could live up and do live up to and do what God was calling them to do. And we feel that way a lot as well. We look at these stories and we're, you know, we, we know the ending of it. We know the end of the book. We know the end of the chapter. We know the end of the story for that, this before. But Moses is, is, is arguing with God. God is speaking to Moses and Moses is arguing with him. He says... Moses says, I, I can't, 
I can't speak well. I can't, I can't speak that well. And if you look at verse 11, it says, it says, Yahweh said to him, Who made the human mouth? For he was being told to demand. To demand that Pharaoh let, the people, let his people go. And some people think that Moses had a stutter or, or something like that. At, at the very least, Moses didn't think that he could speak well, that he wasn't eloquent, that he didn't have the gift of speech or the gift of gab, as they call it. Moses felt like he couldn't speak. I am not good enough to do this. And we know the end of that story. And we know that even though Moses is saying, I can't speak, and God said, I'm going to send Aaron with you. Okay, fine. I'll send Aaron with you. Most of the time that they went before Pharaoh, who did the speaking? Moses, not Aaron. Moses did the vast majority of the speaking before Pharaoh. And God told him, who is it that made the human mouth? I'm going to put the words in your mouth. You ain't got to worry about it. And Moses is still going, but I can't do it. God chose Moses for a specific reason, for a specific purpose, because Moses was the person that God wanted to work with. Through. It wasn't Moses himself doing all of those things. It was God working through Moses. It had nothing to do with Moses being able to speak well. Because God was speaking through him. It had to do with Moses having the qualities that God wanted to work through for his glory. God didn't equip Moses so Moses could run around going, I am so great. God equipped him so that God would get the glory. God equipped Moses so that everyone would know that it was God working through him. Not Moses getting a chip on his shoulder thinking that he was just so great. I want to turn now to the book of Joshua, just a couple of, couple of chapters over here. Just a couple, I, meant, I said chapters, I meant books. Just a couple of books over, Joshua. You don't have to go very far to find another example. Joshua. And we're going to look at Joshua verses 6, or excuse me, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. That's Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. And here we see we see Joshua leading the army, and they come upon Jericho. And Jericho had these massive, impenetrable walls. If you know anything about warfare, and especially medieval, medieval type warfare, this was obviously pre-medieval, but medieval warfare, castle warfare, sieging a wall, when you hear the words impenetrable walls, and you're going for a siege, those walls probably aren't coming down. Even in the medieval ages, when they had more technology with, with catapults and trebuchets and, 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 bat, and giant battering rams and things like that, most sieges were not won because the walls fell. Most medieval sieges were won because you set up camp outside of said castle walls and starved one another. So the people will advance, each man straight ahead. I'm sorry, what? We're laying siege to the city. You said you gave all these people, all the city to me here. Um, and the way that the walls are going to fall down, these are impenetrable walls. And the way that they're going to fall down is that we walk around the, the, for six days, just walk around it, silent. And then on the seventh days, we blow ram's horn and we'll hear a trumpet and yell and the walls are going to fall down. I'm sorry, did, it, did I miss something here? I mean, I know you're God and you can do everything, but you know, that what? God wasn't equipping... Joshua in the way that Joshua would have thought it would have been done. Joshua had to be scratching his head going, I'm sorry, what? 
can you give me something to punch through the walls here? I, I, we're going to walk around. We're going to walk around these walls for six days, style it. And on the seventh day, we take some priests with some ram's horn and blow them, and then we'll hear a trumpet and we yell, and the walls. Uh, I'm not equipped to do this. Joshua's going, I'm not equipped here. I need better equipment. I need better things to get these walls down. I need, I, I'm not equipped to fight this. And God says, you may not be, but I am. You may not have the equipment, but I do. Just like Moses saying, but I stutter. It ain't your mouth is talking. I told you to do something and I can, I'm going to work through you for my glory. But I can't. You can't, but I can. God's saying you may not be able to, but I can through you. You may not be able to do these things, but I'm going to do it through you. And you think, why? Why would God, who could do all these things, why would he do it through a person? Why wouldn't he just do it himself? It shows a level of trust. It shows a level of, of love and trust and trustworthiness that you would trust God to do those things through you and still give the glory and the credit to God. How many of us, if God equipped us to do something like that, would want to take credit for it? Oh, did you see that, dude? Dude, I was I was at Jericho, man, and you know those walls. Ain't nobody ever been through those walls, and you know we walked around it six times, and on the seventh seventh day, we walked around and blew them trumpets horn. And, and, and those rams horn. We heard that trumpet, and we yelled so loud that those walls came down. Or, you know, I went to Pharaoh and I laid it down to him. I went to Pharaoh and I told him, you better do this. These people were called for that specific purpose because they were not going to try to take credit away from God. They were giving the glory to God. When God calls us and equips us, it's extremely important that we still know that it's God that it's equipping us because we... We can't do anything without Him. But whenever He calls us and we're doing His purpose, there's nothing that's impossible. When He calls us and we are working for His purpose and for His glory and giving the credit and giving the glory to Him, there's nothing that's impossible. Because all things are possible with God. I want to look now another story. Gideon. We're going to turn over to Judges. We're going to turn to Judges chapter 6, verse 14. Again, you don't have to flip that many books over in order to get to the next story. Judges chapter 6, verse 14. Judges chapter 6, verse 14. And we see... <laughs> we see the Lord calling Gideon... We see Gideon saying, you know, look, if you look at verse 13, Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? And where are all his wonders that our father told us about? They said, Hasn't the Lord brought us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midian. Verse 14 says, The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and deliver Israel from the power of Midian. Am I not sending you? That last sentence. Am I not sending you? Go with what you have. And I'm sending you. So do you trust me? If I'm sending you to do something, do you think I'm going to set you up for failure? If I'm telling you and God's saying, if I'm telling you to do this, what's the problem? If you've got God backing you and calling you to do something, what's the problem? 
Am I? God says, am I not sending you? So if we turn over to Judges chapter 7, verse 13, just skip over to Judges 7, 4, uh, 7 13. It says, when Gideon arrived, there was a man telling his friends about a dream. He said, listen, I have a dream. A loaf, uh, a loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Mennonite camp, struck a tent, and it fell. The loaf turned, turned, and the tent went upside down so that it collapsed. His friend answered, this is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, son of, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has handed the entire Mennonite camp over to him. They, they kind of, you can read that and say, well, they're saying that it was the sword, the, the sword of Gideon. But they also say, <laughs> God has handed the entire Midianite camp over to him. So even though the sword may be in Gideon's hand, it's God that's controlling all of it. If we go down to verse 22, and, and I'm doing this just so for time base. I really would like you to read this all for yourself. So I'm, I'm skipping just for time base some some key passages here in this story. If we look at verse uh, 22 in chapter 7, verse 22 says, When Gideon's men blew their 300 trumpets, the Lord set the swords of each man in the army against each other. They fled to, to Beth uh, Shittah in the direction of Zira as far as the border of Ebel Maloah near Tabath. Then the men of Israel were called from Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh, and they pursued the Midianites. So what happened there is God took these men, and Gideon was not a commander of an army. He had had no military experience. He had been a farmer, and he's now going to lead these men against a very large Midianite army. So, okay, Gideon goes and he's looking at his men. I mean, it's if you know military, this will be like a, a, a brand new lieutenant coming up to a, a bunch of master sergeants. <laughs> got, a, got, a, got an officer coming in to take, brand new officer trying to tell a bunch of enlisted master sergeants what to do. Um... <clears throat> But he comes in, and he looks at the man, okay, I got this many men. God says, get rid of a bunch of them. But what? No, go ahead and send a bunch of them home. Okay. Well, there's still too many men. Once they left, God says, there's still too many men. Have them go down by the river and see which one's been down to lap the water out of, out of the stream with their tongues and which one uses their hands to drink the water. Okay, uh, 300 used their hands. Yeah, the ones that, that went down and lapped with their tongues, send them home. But Lord, there's only 300 of them that actually use their hands now. Yeah, that's enough. Yeah, that's enough. I'm sorry, what? And God spe makes it specific in this story. He specifically tells them, because it is not by your hand that it's going to be done. God makes it very specific. There's still too many men, and you would take the glory instead of me. So that's why I'm dwindling this down until there's only 300. But what happens, so Gideon has no idea. He's sitting there looking around. He's brand new to this whole war thing. He's brand new to it. But he gets, one of his friends has a vision. One of the soldiers has a vision, has a dream. Okay, so we're going to go in the middle of the night, and we're going to sneak up on the camp. There's still a bunch of them, so even sneaking up, I don't know how well this is going to work. But as they sneak up to the camp, they break into three sections, three groups. And they surround the camp in three groups. And they start yelling and making so much noise that the Midianites turn against each other. They think that there's a giant army surrounding them on three sides, that there's all these men, whenever actually it's just three groups of a hundred. But the Midianites don't know that. It's in the middle of the night, and they turn their swords on each other. 
They start killing each other, not knowing where the enemy's at. That's not something that a trained military army would realistically do unless there was some kind of <clears throat> divine intervention to confuse them even more so than they were. That shows, and God made it clear that I'm sending a bunch of these people out and I'm going to do these things so that you remember who it was that did these things. It may be the sword in your hand, but you know what? They shouted and the Midianites turned their hand against each other so it's the sword in Gideon's hand may not have ever touched blood. They pursued him, but in that moment, they were the Mennonites were scared, they were killing each other, and they fled. So was it the sword of Gideon? No, it wasn't. It was God equipping him to do what God told him to do. Gideon had no military experience, he had no idea what he was doing, and yet he still overtook this very large army because God called him to do that and equipped him not in the way that he thought God didn't equip him with more soldiers as a matter of fact he took soldiers away God doesn't equip us with what we a lot of times think that we need either we have a view of what we think we need to be equipped with and oftentimes, it's the exact opposite of what God actually wants us and equips us with because God is going to equip us with God. <laughs> you don't need that other stuff. God's going to equip you with God. So, I'm going to turn now to a very familiar story. And we've got, we've got several of these, and I want to give numerous examples so that we can see how many times this was done. And I'm, this is not a complete list due to time. I'm only using some of the, the more in-your-face ones, but the whole Bible is full of it, absolutely full of, of these stories. And I'm staying with Old Testament here. These are Old Testament. Go to the New Testament and look at every one of the disciples. Look at, look at the twelve. Look at every one of them. But we're going to stay with the Old Testament for now. I want to turn to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17 verses 4 through 7 is where we're going to start. Well, as soon as you turn there, you're going to know what story we're talking about. It's a very famous story of someone that was absolutely not equipped by himself to do what he did. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 4. We're talking about David and Goliath. We're talking about David versus Goliath. Verse 4 says, Then a champion named Goliath from Gath came out of the Philistine camp. He was nine feet nine inches tall and wore a bronze helmet and bronze scale armor that weighed 125 pounds. I have armor. I have armor over there. I have armor over here. I have different types of armor. There is not a single bit of my armor that weighs 125 pounds. I'm also not nine feet nine inches tall. So it continues describing him. It says there was a uh, there was bronze armor on his shins, and a bronze sword was slung between his shoulders. His spear shaft was like a weaver's beam, and the iron point of his spear weighed fifteen pounds. In addition, a shield bearer was walking in front of him. This dude's decked out. He's nine feet nine inches tall. His armor weighs 125 pounds. The tip of his spear, and I actually have a 680 spear point here. This is the size of an average 
600 AD Germanic spear point. This is an authentic spear, spear tip from 600 AD. That's, a, that's an average spear point, right? Just the tip of his spear weighs 15 pounds. As you can see, that didn't weigh no 15 pounds. So that spear tip alone was huge. He's got a person walking in front of him to carry his shield. That part is missed out a lot when we have a visual representation of David versus Goliath, is that in front of Goliath, there was a person carrying this huge shield. He's also got a sword on his back. That sword was huge. Had to be. We see this giant of a man. And then we know that there's, there's little old David. David was not yet a man. What I mean by that is he, was, he hadn't had his, his, as the Jews would call it now, his bar mitzvah. He hadn't had those things. He wasn't yet a man. He was still a boy, which meant that he was probably about 13, 14 years old. That... That, that's important as well. Also, even for his age, David was a bit of a scrawny runt. David was not the largest, even if you look at his brothers, when you look at when Samuel goes and meets David and his brothers, even da David was the youngest, so he would have been the smallest at that point, yes, but he, well, there was nothing that, that stood out about him of being growing into a large, muscular being. He was still a, a, a young, scrawny boy going up against a nine foot, tall, nine, foot nine giant decked out for war. When we turn to chapter 17, verses 37 through 40, it talks about, it says, One day Jesse told his son David, Take this half bushel of roasted grain along with these ten loaves of bread to your brother, brothers and hurry to their camp. And he tells them to take all these different things to his brothers. So that's why David goes there to begin with. And, and I'm sorry, that was not verse 37, that was verse 17. So uh, he takes all these things down there and his brothers are kind of making fun of him going, Why are you even here? And David says, well, I came to bring you this, but by the way, who is this giant? I'm going to go face him. And his brothers are like, what? Go back home and tend to the sheep. What are you doing here, boy? You know, I've got an 11-year-old son myself. I wouldn't send my 11-year-old son out to face a get face off against a 9-foot-tall giant decked out in armor. I love you, Tristan. You're a great kid. You're pretty strong for your age, but I'm sorry, I wouldn't be sending you out to face him. So verse 37, I apologize, I got a little off track there. Verse 37, um, verse 37 says, Then David said, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, may the Lord be with you. Okay. Then Saul had his own military clothes put on David. He put on a bronze he put a bronze helmet on David on David's head and had him put on armor. David strapped his sword on over the military clothes and tried to walk, but he was not used to them. I can't walk in these, David said to Saul. I can't use them. So David took them off. And instead, he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the wadi, and put them in the pouch in his shepherd's bag. Then, with a sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Most people would think if you're going to face off in war against somebody decked out with, you know, 125-pound scale armor and, and, and shin, shin armor and a giant spear and a giant shield and a giant sword, then you're going to need some armor, dude. So they're trying to equip him with what we would normally think of, of being equipped to go to war. Didn't work. David couldn't walk in it. It wasn't how David needed to be equipped. 
David needed to be equipped by God, not by this outside armor. God's armor was all that David needed. So you've got this young boy facing off against this giant with a sling and some rocks. But he says something very important. He says, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hands of the Philistine. Not my hands are going to take him out. Not I can do this, but the Lord who saved me from a lion and a bear will equip me and protect me as I face off against this giant. So each of these show that God equips us how we need to be equipped to accomplish the goal for His glory. Because none of these could be done by their own hands alone. So when God calls us, we have no real excuse not to answer Him. Because He's going to move mountains to make things possible if it's what He is wanting done. The whole, the whole thing about God will move mountains, God will move mountains if you're doing what He wants done. He will equip you and move things out of the way and do different things that you wouldn't think possible if He's calling you to do something and you're, you're following and giving God glory for the things that He's calling you to do. Not saying, I did this. Not saying, it's me and my hands and I'm the one that did this. If you are following what God calls you to do and God called you to do it, there's nothing that's impossible because God's going to get things done that He wants done. Whether you won't listen to it or not. So we really have no excuse not to answer when God calls. But again, like I said to begin with, we all feel that, but I can't do this. And we start thinking about how we would need this and that and this and that and all these other things. We start thinking about how we need to be equipped. We start putting together, well, I don't have this and I don't have that. Saul was trying to put armor on David. Well, you don't have this and you don't have that. And he's trying to put earthly things and earthly equipment on David. Sometimes those things help. Sometimes we may need those things. Gideon didn't go into that midnight camp without a sword. He did have a sword in his hand. However, what was the equipment that each of them needed? God. But we... We start acting like old Jonah when God calls. You see, they also included in the Bible, we also have a story of someone that when God called, he said, I can't do it, and he ran. So the last verse that I have is Jonah. We're going to turn to old Jonah now. Jonah, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Jonah, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amadi. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh, and preach against it, because their wickedness has confronted me. Okay, so God is calling Jonah, right? Get up and go. I'm sending you. I'm sending you to Nineveh. I am want you to go. I am calling you. And here, God is speaking directly to Jonah. It wasn't a question. It wasn't a, I think God may have said this. No, God's speaking directly to Jonah. And says, get up and go. Okay? So he went, got up and went, right? Because everybody else, you know, may have argued, but they ended up, you know, they ended up kind of following along, even though they argued to begin with. Right? So Jonah went too, right? Not to begin with. Verse 3. However, Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. We read that and we laugh. 
we read that and we laugh because it's the thought of, how are you going to flee from God? God's everywhere. How are you going to flee from God? We laugh at that thought until we look in the mirror. Until we take a look in the mirror and see how many times that God had called us to do something and we went the other way. Because in this story, when we look at where Nineveh and Tarshish is, Jonah specifically went as far as he could in the other direction. How many times does God call us to do something and we turn and go the other way, going, I can't do that. God calls you to do something and you go, I can't do that, I'm going to go the other way. So we laugh at some of these different things. We, we, we look at them and we're like, come on. And we think that it's silly. But how many times do we do it? How many times do we feel that? How many times do we go, God, I can't do that. I need this first. I need that first. And we start trying to piece all these different things together of, well, I got to have this equipment. I got to have that equipment. I got to have this equipment. But if God's calling you to do that, He'll move mountains in order to equip you the way that you need to be equipped. He'll move mountains in order for you to have what you need to do, accomplish what it is that He's telling you to do. And I'm not saying that, that there aren't times that you need other pieces of equipment to accomplish that goal. But God's going to provide a way for you to get those pieces of equipment. What I mean by that is, you know, if you're called into, into ministry... You need some training. You need to be equipped for ministry. There's some training to take, okay? You need to know how to deal with different situations, okay? Does that always turn into you have to have a 15-year a, a PhD? No. You can start in ministry pretty easy, pretty quickly. You need to know what you're talking about. So it needs to be equipped with God's Word. You want a job. You want a different job. Okay, well, this job requires that you know this and that and this and that. Okay, so how do I get that training? God will provide a way for you to get that training if that's what God is wanting you to do in the direction that God is wanting you to go to get a different job, to get that specific type of job. He'll provide different ways and different people that you may run into and talk to in order for you to get what it is that God's calling you to get, if God's calling you to get it. And sometimes you may be turned down for jobs because that job wasn't right for you. That wasn't right for you. You're that I'm sending you here. But if you look at every one of those instances, there's something that happens in every one of them. Something happens. You may not ever see it, and you might. But God's equipping who he needs to equip by you applying for that job. He, your, your application may reach someone else that reaches someone else or reaches someone You don't know how the spider web works. God does. You, your focus and your drive is to follow God's calling and not worry so much about, well, I'm not good enough. Because every person that God used through the Bible had that same thought of, I'm not good enough. Every single one of them thought that they did not have the skills and the equipment to accomplish the task that God was telling them to do. With that, I'm going to close this one out. If you'll bow your heads with me, please. Dear Lord, we just come to you right now, Lord, and we just ask that you make your calling heard. We ask that you make the calling that you have for each one of us. Let it be heard. Let us hear that calling and know that we're on the path that you want us to be on. Lord, we ask that you equip us to be on that path. We ask that you are with us and equip us so that we can, we can walk that path. And Lord, we just ask that you just bless this night, that we have pleasant dreams and a blessed tomorrow. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. With that, I'll see you guys back uh, Sunday morning, Sunday morning service, Sunday morning at 11.
Friday Night Lights, Friday at 8. Wednesday Night Bible Study, Wednesday at 7. Until then, I love you guys, and I will see you later.